Ahoy hoy gang! If this is your first time with us, welcome! And if you're coming from a previous video, hey hey, we love to see it! Regardless, thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you're doing alright. Here we are, Season 4. I said that if you weren't invested after Season 3, you're just not going to be into the show. And the reason I say that is, for all intents and purposes, Season 4 is where the show takes its big leap forward. If the Venture Brothers ended with Season 3, it would have been hailed as one of the best Adult Swim shows ever produced and an unsung marvel of adult animation. Which is high praise, don't get me wrong, but Season 4 is where the show goes from being a really good show to a genre-defining force of animated nature. Season 4 is where they take everything you've loved about the show and elevate it. Season 3 dealt with the past. Season 4 deals with grief and growth. I know I said there was a content warning at the beginning of Season 1, but honestly, it really doesn't come into play until this season. This is where things are going to get really heavy, and none of these characters are going to be the same. So without further ado, there's a lot in store, here in Season 4. As I said in the intro, Season 4 is where the show actually gets started. Everything up to this point was essentially a prologue. Think about it. From Season 1 to Season 2, there may have been a few months in the twins unaliving, but other than Hank and Dean not being around in the introduction of Jonas, that's all that really happened. Season 2 to Season 3, we got the Sovereign, Phantom Limb's plan was foiled, and the Monarch and Sheila got married. That's relatively it. Season 3 to Season 4? We get the introduction of General Traster. Hank and Dean's clones are wiped out. Brock is assumed gone after getting caught in an explosion. Sergeant Hatred becomes the new family bodyguard. And Henchman 24 and Helper were taken out in that explosion as well. Like, that's where we come into Season 4. And the season premiere is a brilliantly interwoven web of time skips that slowly parse out the information you need to keep going. Brock survived the explosion with Helper implanted in his chest and was saved by the OSI who also pumped Sergeant Hatred full of meds to make the bad thoughts go away so that he could look after the Venture compound. Brock escapes and vows to get revenge on the people that betrayed him, including Molotov and Hunter. Hank finds Brock's jacket and Helper's head in a box and starts to grow his hair out and wears his jacket everywhere. Dean gets a new dog named Giant Boy Detective and is growing out a mustache, all while a bunch of German bad guys try and get Doc to clone a prominent German bad guy leader. We also find out that the OSI had no idea about his cloning tech and are shutting it down while he rebuilds Helper and 21 goes on a journey of growth and vengeance, vowing to find whoever caused the explosion that took away his best friend. It's a lot, and we're not even done yet! Brock goes to see the doctor that did Hunter's surgery and gets a plate and Helper extracted, and this is where we see something really interesting. I'm gonna nerd out about this for a little bit. The doctor explains that ever since the Iron Man movie, everyone wants the robot heart. They establish in a world where effectively Doctor Strange and the Fantastic Four just walk around like it's every day, people still care about the MCU. Like this entire episode has panels referencing Marvel issue number one back when they were pulp comics and just shows how deep the love for comics and that kind of media in the series goes. I mean, this was 2009 era. This is still ludicrously deep cuts and it's just, man, it's great. We also get Brock going to hunt the Blackhearts when he's confronted by a Sphinx agent, trying to do the same until he's knocked unconscious. Meanwhile, we see Hatred trying to bond with the boys and train them so they're ready for anything. We've seen the characters take on vastly different personas, and I really kind of love it. Dean has become far more emotional and almost depressed in a way, while Hank is turning into a jean jacket wearing rebel. He's grown his hair out, and you can actually feel the growth of the character. And in much that same vein, Sergeant Hatred is the living embodiment of a rehabilitated character. They could have just as easily said that he switched sides at the end of Season 3 and that was it. He's still the gruff menace he always was, but he's not. He's on new meds, he's not treating the boys like the enemy anymore. He genuinely wants them to like him and see that he's changed. He is taking his mission seriously and even pushes Hank to shoot him if it means it earns his trust. I mean, the way they have Hatred go all in on the Venture family is just fantastic. He feels realized. This whole episode is re-establishing everything we know and the growth feels natural. You have 21 training and bulking up not only to get revenge, but here is Gary, the fat that nerdy guy given drive, given something to work towards. 24 passing gave him purpose and a duty to realize. He becomes the monarch star henchman. He becomes actualized. For once, he becomes Gary. 
even at the end of the episode when Brock and Hunter are tied up in a dark room and Brock starts to piece everything together, you start to put everything together and everything you see up to this point starts to making sense. All the pieces start falling into place. Hunter reveals he had a reverse sex change operation and that he, Mile High, Shore Leave, and the Doctor are the newly resurrected Sphinx and recruit Brock into their new shadowy organization. Brock even runs into Hank after taking out a dog possessed by the soul of a German leader bad guy, and you feel a sense of hope after all of this tension. By the end of this jam-packed 23 minutes, you feel like there's hope in the show. That there's growth. Season 1 through 3 established that these characters fail a lot. However, Season 4 sees these characters we've watched struggle and fight through hardship after hardship actually make progress. We see them actually grow. We see them succeed. This might be the strongest season premiere of any animated series ever. It really touches on everything it needs to and sets up a vast array of questions left open and needing answers. This is the jumping off point of a perfect, flawless season. Alright, full disclosure, this is kind of a tricky episode to navigate, but here we go. Hank and Dean are captured by the Monarch. Usual venture fair. However, Hank is rescued by the shining crusader of our life-giving star, Captain Sunshine! Captain Sunshine, played by the Taken Too Soon, once in a generation voice talent of Kevin Conroy, aka Batman. He then proceeds to literally throw Monarch in jail and takes Hank with him to the Sanctum Solarium. While we had Professor Impossible and Dr. O, this is the first time we get an actual superhero introduced in the show, and it makes sense they'd fight the villains of the guild. We even saw some portrayed in Fallen Arches in the video, but none actually interacting with the Ventures. And so yeah, Hank has been chosen to be the new Wonder Boy! And the Monarch holds Dean hostage while they try and stall till they can get Hank back to return both to Doc after taking his ransom. We also see that Pete and Billy got a settlement check and got a ton of money to put conjectural technologies on the map. The wild thing about this episode is that it's largely a Hank episode. Think about it, how many times has there been a Hank or just a Dean episode? Sure, they've been separated, but they didn't really have much to do in the grand scheme of the episode. Here, Hank is front and center and carries a lot of the narrative weight as he's sworn in as the new Wonder Boy after the Monarch took out the last one. It's important to note the Wonder Boy Monarch took out was not in fact the first Wonder Boy. Anyway, we find out Captain Sunshine's alter ego is news anchor with the Channel 5 News at night, and by day is a superhero fighting group including members like Barbecue and Ghost Robot. Captain Sunshine is very obviously a parody of both Superman and Batman and the weird elements they both have. Kevin Conroy having famously played Batman and Batman the Animated Series and several other projects, obviously. I think he wouldn't have done as well as a character without Kevin Conroy voicing him. It just adds another intentional layer to the episode, and to hear him in a comedic role is both jarring and welcome in the best possible way. We get to see Hank living out his dreams of being a sidekick, or even getting closer to realizing his true identity as Batman. We see 21 actually running into missions head first with knives on his wrists. Like remember the Gary at the end of season 3? He was smearing salsa and chips on his face to look battle scarred for after the fight. Now he has a 5 o'clock shadow and has bulked up significantly. Now that being said, at the end of the day he's still the nerdy comic loving Gary, but he's making necessary changes to his life to be better. We're seeing an actualized Gary. Anyway, Captain Sunshine has inappropriate relations with his wards and it's a whole thing. That's why it's such a weird episode to talk about. I know it seems like I'm glossing over it, and I am, I'm not trying to get demonetized, but it's not like it detracts from the episode as a whole. Like, no one condones it or anything, it just is like that, I guess. That being said, Handsome Ransom is what these new filler episodes will be like. There is still growth in them, but overall they're there to just tell an elevated story. Like a news team being a superhero team? That's clever and plays into their different themes perfectly. This is a phenomenal way to show us the growth of Pete and Billy that will be touched on later in the season. We get a better understanding of the mundane rulings of the guild and it just has so many extra layers to it. And yet through all of it, the part with Copter 5 gets me every single time. I mean, just seeing Captain Sunshine screaming Wonder Boy and the narrator going, what brings you to Copter 5? I mean, it's just, it's amazing. It's flawless. I have no notes. It has those great one-off jokes while also just smacking you in the face with quality. 
Like at the end of the day, nothing was lost going from season three to season four. You're still getting great comedy and sharp writing, but there's just a deeper quality to it. There's something underneath the surface that is pulling you forward, that is keeping you engrossed. This is only the second episode of season four, and yet it feels like we've already been in the season for so long in a good way. It feels familiar while also feeling drastically improved. What a surreal episode. This is an episode that could only exist in season four. No other place would make sense and it's just magical in a way. We open with a flashback to Doc showing Brock the clones for the first time and terminating a failed product. However, that faulty Dean clone exists to this day and has been hiding away in the attic. We then flash forward with Doc showing his usual favoritism to Dean and making Hank do menial chores because he talked back to him and mocked him in front of company. You definitely feel that he's being way harsher on Hank than usual, and the way it makes you viscerally upset shows how much they've developed the characters. I want you to remember this. I want you to remember how you feel while watching Perchance to Dean, because that feeling, that sense of unfairness will actually be addressed, even though they don't go over the head and go like, this is a plot point that will be addressed later you still get the feeling that you're going to get some sort of emotional conclusion to what's going on. If this was just the beginning, you could write it off, but here we see Hank just getting pushed around and you can feel that it just isn't fair. Anyway, Hank runs into a delivery driver who he thinks has shining telepathy powers, and Dean is introduced to the world of prog rock by Rusty to hopefully awaken his mind's eye. Not only is this super cool with how they animated Dean's interpretations of the song, it also shows that Doc does have a human side to him and that he wants to share with his boys. And while his favoritism is showing towards Dean right now, they don't ignore it and confront it again later in the season. All of this juxtaposed with a failed Dean clone trying to salvage other clone bodies to build the perfect bodysuit. However, when he's dragging the final piece to the attic, Hank and Dermot hit the clone corpse and thinking that they ran over Dean, begin to plan their getaway and eventual run from the law. I really do love that the more we see Dermot, the more Hank is questioning every little thing about him. Like, he gets that he's full of it, but he still sees the charm of having a friend, and it's a wonderful development for Hank. Anyway, the driver does in fact have shining powers and gets to the sheriff to raid the compound where they find a bunch of docks made out of C4 as a defensive strategy and then we see the failed clone hug one of the C4 docks and explodes and that's that. I mean, here is an episode that builds off the clone idea in an unexpected way. And yeah, the failed clone tries to take out the current Dean and that's a whole thing, but all in all, it's wrapped so quickly yet concisely that it still feels satisfying even if the episode is only 23 minutes. Again, yeah, an episode like this wouldn't fit in any other season and shows that it is just a smaller part of a much larger masterpiece. Season 4 really doesn't have any fat that could be trimmed. Even episodes like this feel packed full of growth, even if the story doesn't really go anywhere, and that's okay. Season 4 is longer because it takes that time to focus on the characters, and as we'll get into later, it was actually released in two batches. But I digress. Perchance to Dean is something special. It's something unique because when you see Dean reacting to the prog rock songs and melting away and growing old as he's riding a dragon, it makes you get a good idea of what inspires Doc because this is what he wants to share with him. This is what he wants Dean to use for super science compared to honestly the neglect that he experienced from his father. Like Doc is not a good person. I, I'm not a Doc apologist, but he is at least trying at some point to be a better dad than his was. He is trying to raise the boys. If he didn't care, he wouldn't keep clones around. And we just, we have to keep remembering that. He's doing his best, even if his best is nowhere good enough. As I said earlier, season four is very much about grief and growth. And there's no better example of this than Gary, AKA Henchman 21. The episode opens with some grunt henchmen running into Gary at the bar on the cocoon, and he says that 24 wasn't in an accident, but that someone took him out, and he was going to find out who. This is how you evolve a character. 
Gary has been transformed by the loss of 24 and is now one of the most respected members of the Monarch's crew. Sure, he still has his nerdy side, but he's evolving in real time into an actualized person determined to avenge his friend. He makes a list of possible suspects, and number one on that list is, of course, the Venture Brothers, Hank and Dean. All this while Monarch prepares for an interview and photo spread when he has a re an allergic reaction that causes his face to swell up. But it's very much just about Gary, who's talking to 24's skull, and you can feel that he's starting to slip. Meanwhile, Hatred is trying to train the boys to survive since they don't exactly have a backup plan anymore. However, that same training gets them kidnapped by a very competent 21. I mean, he's not only able to take out Hatred, but also effectively kidnaps the boys, gets them to a secret hideout, and once Hatred calls the Monarch and gets Sheila, she has to find the boys so there isn't an illegal kidnapping attached to them. Something that was already set up earlier in the season with Handsome Ransom. Again, another fantastic episode that knows exactly what it wants to do and how to stick the landing with it. Seeing Gary try and rationalize death is terrific. Seeing Hatred actually being competent and showcasing his knowledge of malice to get him and Doc in is wonderful. I mean, there's just so many things to love about the episode and it just lands on every note that it tries. That end conversation between Sheila and Doc just feels so genuine. And at the end of the day, you get that they're enemies, but that they don't hate each other a very careful line to toe but it's so important that they aren't active antagonists even that moment with 21 and the monarch in the treehouse is just chilling in a good way it explains why people follow the monarch when everyone else sees him as just a dumb butterfly villain he has more hate in his heart than anyone and he hates himself more than anyone else could the man is confident in who he is, and it's no secret that 21 is inspired by that. Even in the end of the episode, we get a red herring of the list being checked off and the skull moving in Gary's room that adds to that extra layer to everything. If it's the ghost of 24, that's one thing. If it's someone else, that's another. But we definitely know it's not Gary, and that means something is up. Return to Malice is very much a return to form, where we got effectively two episodes focused on Hank and then Dean, here we get more world building as well as a better focus on Sheila, 21, and the Monarch as characters. We see the strained relationship between Hatred and Hank, and Dean is just fed up with it all. Like these feelings carry over from episode to episode until they're addressed, and I just love that. I love that there are consequences for people's actions, and of course Hank holds Brock on a pedestal and has justified reasons to not like or trust hatred it feels earned and while the episode is largely small scenes it helps build the characters beautifully the venture brothers isn't afraid to take that time to psychoanalyze its characters it's not afraid to make these smaller scale adventures remember things like escape to the house of mummies where they were traveling through time and doing all these complex things with edgar Allan poe and caligula here it's just them going on a kidnapping mission it's just 21 trying to rationalize his best friend taken from him so suddenly. And at the end of it, you can't even say he's wrong for thinking something happened. It's just, it's tragic in a way. And it's horrible to say, but without what happened to 24, there's no way Gary would have ever grown up. This is necessary pain for him. This is necessary growth. How do you move past losing your best friend? What shows tackle that with the proper emotional baggage that that comes with? I, I just think a show that, th I mean, these episodes came out over a decade ago and they still have such narrative weight and I just don't think we appreciate that enough. And now we have an episode that blows everything wide open. Going off the reveal that Phantom Lim is still very much alive after he unalived Manotar, we see him raiding the guild headquarters with a toaster, mug, and shoe to gain information on the orb. Which, and I do need to correct myself, while I said in the last season review Doc found it and put it back, he did take it back to the compound, he just didn't do anything with it. He left it alone, but kept it safe. And so Lim picks off and kidnaps two members of the Council of Thirteen, Red Mantle and Dragoon, and has Billy, the same person that gave him his fantastical limbs, put Dragoon's head on Red Mantle's body to fish secrets out of them about the guild and the orb, convinced he's the true and rightful heir to the guild and that he'll take it out from under the Sovereign one way or another. 
The guild then goes on to secure the orb and marches on the compound, and when Hatred thinks they're coming for him and the family, he enlists Hank's help to save them all and Hank decides to see how long he can milk it for. The scenes with Hank and Hatred are just so dang wholesome. Hatred is by no means a perfect character. He is 100% flawed and has very unsettling characteristics. But seeing him actively combat them and doing everything he can to keep the boys safe from a writing perspective is super smart and really works for his character. Like, I know this is supposed to be about Phantom Limb creating the Revenge Society and taking out the guild, but like, it's a much more personal story than that. You have Doc teaching Dean to hide away like a true super scientist, Hank and Hatred actually bonding for a change, Billy's skills being showcased, and a great introduction to Dragoon and Red Mantle as characters as they'll be recurring throughout the rest of the show. And I think the culmination of everything with the guild confronting Lim on the front lawn of the compound is perfect. Remember, the series is about failure and growth. Doc failing to live up to Jonas, Hatred failing at being in the OSI, then as a villain, now again as an OSI agent, and Lim failing to retake the guild because you can't retake what was never yours. He gets the power of the orb, attempts to use it to wipe out his enemies, and nothing. Turns out, Sandow broke the orb when he confronted the original founding venture, and they decided to just not tell anyone. And it also turns out that Phantom Lim isn't the inheritor of the guild, but the rightful leader is none other than Dean, who proceeds to just pass it back off to the Sovereign, because of course he does. And just like that, Phantom Lim is captured, his entire plan a failure, and Red Mantle and Dragoon have to learn how to adjust to their new two-headed one-body life. Like, I don't want to go too in-depth five episodes into a 16-episode season, but look at how much momentum is picking up. Again, J.G. Thurwell's soundtrack is one of the most prominent soundtracks in any series, and it truly feels like a character all its own. The background music perfectly conveys the tone of any scene. There's always that famous quote by the now-canceled Joss Whedon, Do gritty and dark, but for the love of God, throw a joke in there. What makes the Venture Brothers work is that it treats itself as a comedy first and adds dark scenes and suspense into it. Yes, it can make gratuitous violence funny, but it can also just have these high-octane fights that carry an actual weight to them. They establish stakes, and even if there is a dour low note, they don't try and break it with a thousand jokes. Sometimes you just sit and appreciate a moment. The Venture Brothers is a masterclass in how to write to convey emotion without beating an audience over the head with symbolism and wit, and I think a large part of that comes from it being such a small team. The creative integrity of Jackson Public and Doc Hammer is unquestioned. They know how to tell this story, they know these characters, and they make sure that they craft each episode, each piece, perfectly. Is this something this character would do? Is this something, how would they react? How would they think about this? What would they do in their own way? Are they flawed? Are they perfect? How can we do this? And the fact that there was very little studio meddling in the story, just in the release, speaks volumes for that. This is what happens when an animated property is allowed to just be a show. I mean, this is a show where the main villain is a man named the Monarch who flies around in a giant cocoon. It could be Rick and Morty levels of parody and comedy, but instead you get confronting grief and understanding that it's okay to not be okay. You get people fighting for redemption. And it's just, where did this come from? Why is this happening now? It's, it's beautiful. Venture Brothers truly, unequivocally, is one of the most beautiful shows ever made. And I, I just, I can't stop saying that. Doc is being hunted down by the Monarch, who revs up his web launcher to work him like a puppet, but when he gets a notification on his phone about group therapy, the Monarch begrudgingly has to let him go. When I first saw this episode when it aired, I absolutely couldn't stand it and didn't really get it. I was also, like, 13. As I've gotten older, this is not only one of the smartest episodes, but also just one of the strongest of the entire season. That being said, let's get the B story out of the way first. Hank and Dean go to the movies with Hatred, and 21 the crew are there because their planned henching was cancelled. Hatred runs out of his pills and starts panicking as he runs off to the panic room to try and control his urges, and yeah, it's... oof. It's a wild thing to cut away to, to... Hank and Dean ultimately working with 21 to take Hatred down and get him back on his meds. It's, yeah, it's a lot. 
uh, the TV, the show is TVMA for a reason, folks. Does it work? Uh, sure, yeah, of course. It does help with the characters and everything, but that storyline would not have been written in the year of our Lord 2023. Again, it absolutely works, it's just a product of its time. And then we have the A story, which is phenomenal and much needed. Like, we've had Hank or Dean or even Brock episodes, but how many times have we had a Doc episode? How many times have we focused solely on his adventures? Maybe once earlier in Midlife Chrysalis, and even then it doesn't really go into anything since it's a season one episode. Doc goes to therapy with Action Johnny, one of the previous Wonder Boys played by Patton Oswalt, Robo Boy, a play on Astro Boy, and the Hale Brothers played by Seth Green and John Hodgman respectively. Doc reveals that his first therapist was his father, who guilt-tripped him about the issues he came to him with, and would say that he blamed and resented his father even though his father gave him everything, which understandably gave him a fear of therapy. It's great that there's group therapy for boy adventurers, and the best thing is, they treat it as just a normal counseling session. It's not some magical adventure or anything, it's grown men addressing the wild things adults threw them into, and how they've struggled to cope with it, and it really makes you appreciate Doc. He didn't have a childhood. Wonder Boy developed an eating disorder and still walks around in the costume. The Hale brothers pretty obviously unalived their dad, and we've seen what happened to Action Johnny, and Robo Boy just doesn't know any better. Doc is actually somewhat put together. He's not perfect, but how could anyone be when they go through that as a kid? And when the therapist is taken out by a two-step viper, the boy adventurers rile themselves up into another adventure to find out who took out their therapist, eventually hunting down Dr. Z, of all people, in Florida, and accusing him when he turns around and gives them the best advice he can. Sometimes tragedy happens. You can't keep looking for adventures and mysteries where there aren't any. It's okay to just live. And when Doc comes to his realization, it feels deserved. He has the compound. He has the boys. He didn't take out his dad or walk around in rusty venture clothes. He grew up and didn't lose everything like Johnny did. Doc grew up. And that's why he's so harsh on Hank and encourages Dean. He wants Dean to be nurtured into super science instead of thrown into it like he was. He's not perfect, again, by any stretch of the word, and he still very much has his problems, but we see why he's like he is, and we also see he could have been so much worse. It puts past tense and his relationships with his friends into a better perspective. He's trying to be the best him he can be. He's trying to be a scientist, he cracks jokes, and he's actually likable to some people. Imagine Action Johnny as a father, or Wonder Boy. Doc is at least attempting to avoid having the boys raised in the same world he was. And as we learn more about what he went through, he's that much more humanized. The series may be about failure, but here we genuinely see that Doc isn't as much of a failure as we thought he was. That last bit with Dr. Z really is heartwarming though. Seeing him guide the men that he still considers boys, and while he was a villain, now he's just a gentle old man offering his pieces of wisdom. That message juxtaposed with hatred fighting his urges to touch kids is really just tonal whiplash, but I don't know, it's kind of the magic of the Venture Brothers. The stories just shine because they don't try to make them fit. They can be vastly different and still work together. And then you find out Monarch took out the therapist and it all makes sense instantly. I say this a lot in my American Dad videos about how what makes the show work is they usually have an outlandish A story and a simple B story with an outlandish twist, and that idea is perfectly translated to The Better Man. The A story has the triad fighting Torrid, and when he summons an eldritch evil, he's taken out by the Outrider, aka THE MAN WHO STOLE Orpheus's WIFE! He discovers that the Outrider has gained the power to access the Phantom Dimension, something that he could never do, and is determined to one-up the man that took his beloved from him. Meanwhile, Dean is dressing up to try and impress Triana as she hangs out on the lawn until Hank drags him to the mall to pick up chicks. That's right, Hank goes to the mall to pick up chicks. It's great seeing him just totally delusional as he hits on the girls, and even though he has no game whatsoever, he's at least trying and trying to push Dean out to give it a shot. It's great seeing the two boys bond as brothers, and even having Dermot around to offer some rare advice is terrific. And I mean, just think about that. Hank is going off the compound. 
three seasons ago they would have never left but now while they have their learner's permits he's actually going off he's seeing the world he's experiencing it on his terms he's not just going in some super jet and flying across the country he's just going to the mall he's just interacting with normal people anyway basically the outrider cheated his way into getting the power and after orpheus confronts the master to figure out what he's doing wrong triana sneaks in and meets him again this time he doesn't wipe her memory and instead shows her what dean will look like in the future because of how many times he's been cloned and tells her she needs to get out and discover herself the episode is great it's a wonderful triad focused adventure that sort of feels like one half blade hellboy as a sitcom and you are here the documentary about a mall the two tones never feel like they clash and it's great that triana is moving on and going to live with her mom to learn magic while dean is open to giving up on his teenage crush and branch out the kids are growing up and the adults are just as childish as ever with orpheus insanely jealous of his wife's new husband I don't know, having Al and Jefferson around is almost essential for Orpheus now. He just feels more complete with his team, even if they feel like they don't do anything. They make him a much more rounded person. He's a Sorcerer Supreme, but he's always at a 10. They bring him down a little bit, they help him relax, they help him keep the balance, and I think this episode does a great example of that. Sure, he's the power, but he couldn't do half the things he does without them. He's also just a single dad trying his best, and the fact that they hang on that is terrific. Triana isn't leaving because of Orpheus, she's leaving because she wants to and she still loves her dad and he still loves her more than anything. He just wants his little pumpkin to be safe. I don't know, I always thought their relationship was just kind of perfect and I like that there wasn't an added conflict between the two. That he just wants her happy, he just wants her taken care of. It's one of the sweetest out there and having him make that peace after bringing back the Outrider from his coma again with the help of Billy really feels like the conclusion of an arc. The season is about growth, and for once it feels like Orpheus is ready to move on. Like even just comparing Orpheus and Doc as dads, Orpheus is willing to let Triana go out on her own. He doesn't have any protection plans for Triana, he just doesn't want her hurt. He doesn't want her in the same world that he's in. And I just, I really love that about him, I don't know. Orpheus and Brock were always the moral pillars of the Venture family, and it's so fascinating to see where they are without Brock seven episodes in. Gee, I sure hope Brock doesn't show up soon. I'm just kidding, everybody loves Brock. You can't hate Brock, Brock's the best. So, fun fact, season 4 was actually broken into two parts and released with each part having eight episodes. And so, here we have the mid-season finale, Pinstripes and Poltergeist, and boy howdy does it feel like a mid-season finale. The Monarch goes to meet Monstroso, the supervillain lawyer, and is ready to crush Doc once and for all. We see the ghost of 24 talking to 21, which I have to believe is a psychosis that really materialized after he saw the skull move when he didn't move it. Sure, he had been talking to the skull before, but now 24 is actually giving him advice on his surroundings. Anyway, yeah, the Monarch teams with Monstroso, who effectively claims the Venture compound through a legal loophole when it's discovered Doc isn't using all of the compound for do-goodery. And so Doc enlists Billy and Pete to move onto the premises to help balances numbers and when they go to a factory they discover the secret headquarters of sphinx led by the always terrific hunter gathers basically doc wants them to pay for using the factory as a headquarters so he can get around the claim but they refuse stating why they do what they do sphinx exists for when a supervillain doesn't want to join an organization and decides to just torment regular everyday people if they abuse the system they get a visit from sphinx it's a great idea that makes a lot of sense for someone like Hunter to put together when he can't trust the guild or the OSI to get the job done. I think seeing Brock and Shoreleave on a mission is super important because the exposition feels natural. The banter makes the world building just a little bit more palatable. Like you're going to have exposition. Every series has it, whether it's several episodes of just info dumping or it's a chunk here and there. The goal when writing is to deliver your exposition as naturally as possible. How would a character react to that information based off who they are? And to have Brock and Shoreleave talking and then juxtapose that with how Hunter and the gang explain it to Doc, it's a nice touch. I don't know, the small things compound into what makes this series so great. Anyway, it's then discovered by the Monarch that Monstroso is double-crossing him and plans to write him out of Arching Dock. And so to stop Monstroso, 21 goes to the compound to prepare for an ambush when he runs into Brock and they have probably one of the most satisfying fight scenes ever. 
Is it hyper violent? No, absolutely not. But what makes it so great is how it's a direct reference to their encounter in Tag Sailor It. Back then, 21 approached him like a Jedi, and when his lightsaber failed to do anything, Brock literally scared him away by saying boo. Brock tries to do the same thing again, and they actually seriously go at it. Now, whether he was really trying or playing around with 21, who really knows? But he genuinely earns Brock's respect, and that's something magical. I mean, this is the first time he's had someone that is just genuinely trying and putting in effort to be a hero, and it almost feels like Brock has a proper protege. Where Hank looks up to him, he and 24 have a mutual respect that he would never have gotten until the growth of Season 4. We also get introduced to Sphinx's brain wiping machine that they use to wipe the boys' memories quite a few times. It's a funny bit, and I do appreciate that they don't regularly use it on screen. However, as Monstroso fills out paperwork, he's interrupted by one wandering Jedi who tells him to tear up his contract. The episode ending with Gary and Brock throwing down with Monstroso and Hank seeing Brock that night in utter shock. Pinstripes and Poltergeist is just outstanding. It could be a lesser show's season finale, and yet here it's such a strong midpoint that I couldn't imagine any other episode going in its place. The way it builds the world makes it such a key waypoint moving forward. You get Monstroso, Sphinx proper, the bond between 21 and Brock, and just man, it brings a tear to your eye revisiting this knowing what's coming in the rest of the season. I mean, just looking back at the last eight episodes, the show just feels like it's truly elevated already. It could have stopped here and been hailed as a wonderful next level piece of media, and yet it just keeps climbing. It just keeps improving on what's already been established. And here we have our continued ascent. We open with 21 leading the charge as he controls the cocoon and sends the Moppets after Hatred and the Boys on his first solo arching. We also get the return of a very sick King Gorilla being visited by the Monarch and Sheila. And this is where the show effectively reveals its storylines. 21 is tired of the henchmen being outgunned against someone like Hatred while the Monarch flies around atop his elegant butter glider. Alongside Brock, Shore leaving the boys, shrinking in a sub to go inside Doc to see why he's effectively stroking out since his insurance got denied and that's really all they have. These story ideas could have been just the most bare bones concepts and just been that, but instead we see a beautiful play on them and with the clot in Doc's vein being caused by a clone set of Hank and Dean using a tiny submarine to explore their dad and getting stuck, and 21 striking retaliation to the monarch blowing money on a butter glider and not body armor for his men, all encouraged by Sheila. There's a musical number with the butter glider, and I'm not going to lie to you, that was the moment that monarch became the next level to me. That's how you write a perfect character. From that point forward, no matter what he did, he'd be one of the best written characters of all time, no question. The Diving Bell vs. the Butter Glider is a phenomenal episode and a great way to jump back into the series after an almost year-long break. This episode literally could not have come before Pinstripes and Poltergeist and plays too much off of the elements and relationships already built for, again, basically a filler episode. Yes, it shows the respect between 21 and the Monarch and even the start of Sheila really listening to Gary while giving us more peak shore leave and Brock and the boys' relationship maturing as they grow up. He still treats them like boys, but I don't know, there's something deeper in Brock's relationship with Hank and Dean now. Like when 21 bends the knee and puts his mask back on as the monarch swoops back in, remembering that arching venture is more important than his butter glider while still flying on his butter glider, and it's just one of those scenes that to this day I still think about as just peak television. If you watch a Gendy Tartakovsky animation, you're going to get a lot of motion and action, but very little dialogue unless it's absolutely necessary, because it's more about body language than anything else, and there's a magic in that. With Doc Hammer and Jackson public, it's very much the nuance of the characters and the dialogue. Sheila isn't above going behind the monarch if it's for the good of everyone. 21 isn't the same tubbo he used to be and will stand up when he needs to. Hank and Dean can handle more mature missions. Even early in the episode, Hank is firing a turret atop the Jeep at the cocoon. Season 1 Hank wouldn't do that, especially not as effectively. Again, it's that, it's that nuance. They're not telling you that Hank studied in the mountains for 8 years and now knows 18 different schools of karate with 88 new special techniques. They're showing you that small incremental growth that builds him up more and more. Like, I know it sounds like I'm harping on it, but right now I want you to try and think of three really great examples of this other than in Venture Brothers. If you can think of any, post them in the comments below. But if you had any difficulty with it, 
That's my point. It's such a hard thing to do well, and the pacing of their growth just feels so dang natural. I don't know. It would be very easy to write off the Diving Bell vs. the Butter Glider as just a fluff mid-season premiere. And I'll admit, I probably did a few rewatches in my youth, but now I see just how important it is and what an excellent kicking off point it is. Not only does it remind you what these characters are, it showcases their growth. And, I mean, even just what Hatred does as he's protecting Doc while they go inside him. The establishment that Sphinx has a submarine and uses their Doc. It's, it's these small things that all compound in on one another that build the story up. And it would not be this complex if they had more writers, if they had more creators. Like, this is just two people crafting a beautiful narrative and it cannot be championed enough especially with all the work that they had to go into with it i mean think about all that effort think about all that time to make a show with just a skeleton crew effectively and then for it to be this it's mind-boggling how is this an adult swim show how was this something that they were willing to put money into when they were basically doing flash animation with everything else with, say, Aqua Teen or Squid Billies? I, it just, it blows my mind. It blows my mind that a show like this can exist. With their studies and their education bets completed, the boys get a congratulations from their grandfather and announce that they're now ready to join their next adventure in college. Only Hank didn't get his diploma for some reason. Meanwhile at the guild, Red Mantle and Dragoon are trying to adjust to being one councilman instead of two, while Phantom Limb talks to a mug and sends wisdom to get the rest of the Revenge Society. This is where things start to get weird, and I wish I got how the powers work, but I'm a fan either way. His attached limbs and inanimate objects save him, and he runs off a free man ready to create his own evil guild with the perfect sidekick to rebuild his body. Professor Impossible, one of his fellow Boys Brigade members. This is also when we get a golden addition to the cast. Bill Hader is the new voice for Professor Impossible, and we also get him as his arch Phineas Phage. Like, obviously, it's no secret that Bill Hader is a terrific voice, actor and overall absurd talent of a man but i don't know it really feels like he puts in a lot of effort and care into each role he gets i'll be honest i totally blank that kate mckinnon plays dermot's mom and sister on top of her roles later in the series i don't know there are people out there that can bash them eight ways to sunday but both actors really truly care about their craft and it shines because of it no one is in the Venture Brothers for the paycheck, and I really appreciate that. I mean, if they are, they make it almost impossible to tell, which should speak to their talent as well. Anyway, Hank looks for ways to not go to college while Doc gets Dean ready to visit campus and go to state just like he did. Hank deciding that he'll just join Sphinx and Hunter and Shore leave agreeing to test him just to prank the poor kid. Remember that tangent about incremental growth? When we get Hank doing the training course, think back to early show Hank. He wouldn't have tried at all. Even when he shaves his hair down to toehead status again, it feels like a return to form but not him downgrading. He wears his look with a renewed confidence. He fights through trial after trial, gets through the brain wiping machine to their shock, and it really exemplifies that he isn't all talk anymore. He's been through hell and he's come out stronger for it. We also get introduced to the rookie at Sphinx, a masked individual that keeps fumbling the job. They just seem to appear out of nowhere for some reason, but I'm sure that won't matter at all, and they're just another wonderful addition to the crew! And even with all this, we still have the B story of Dean touring campus with his dad, who thinks because Jonas donated a ton of money to the school, Dean should get in without any issue. But they get rejected while Professor Impossible covers up for Phantom Limb as he gets attacked by guild hunting dogs. We also get the return of Mr. Brisby and the introduction of the silent investors that are just three guys and super mega spooky. We set up the Revenge Society actually being a real threat, recruiting new members like Professor Impossible turned Professor Incorrigible and Baron Von Underbite. We get Dean discovering a world outside the compound and Hank doubling down on his dream job even when Brock has to talk him down about pursuing it. Like, you don't need me to tell you that this is a great episode. It just works on so many levels, and you feel that it's going to have that potential right as the episode begins. When Hunter throws the phone, it ruins me. I'm devastated. I am dry wheezing on the ground. I mean, that is just peak comedic timing through and through. That is a shot that, like, you could have written out in any other show, but for Venture Brothers, that is essential. 
This is just some small tight-knit crew, and yet they've sculpted something so incredible, so broad, so in-depth, and yet it still feels familiar because they took the time early on to build these elements. Season 4 would not feel so cohesive if it wasn't for seasons 1 through 3. Again, seasons 1 through 3 are very much a prologue to everything that's coming afterward. And then we have the biggest fluff piece of the entire season. But you know what's so great about it? That's the point. Any which way but Zeus opens with Zeus, god of thunder and rock and roll, blasting in and taking the sidekicks away from heroes and villains and bringing them to a gladiatorial thunderdome where they duke it out for his and Zero's amusement. Pete and Billy, alongside Shoreleave, 21, and Captain Sunshine's butler are taken hostage and have to fight the other sidekicks on the field of battle. Meanwhile, all the organizations get together to try and figure out where all the sidekicks got taken and the wonderful world of bureaucracy happens. They get the guild and OSI together, the Peril Partnership, the newly formed Revenge Society, all in one room under the always super charismatic General Traster. And they literally do nothing. They just spin in circles while everyone else figures out what's going on. All this while the compound is left untouched and Doc, feeling neglected, goes outside with a sign to entice Zeus to kidnap him too. This is probably the closest to a real story in the episode. Hatred Hank and Dean, seeing him so upset that he didn't get abducted, decide to abduct and torture him as a means of validating him. I don't know, after self-medication this is just so heartwarming to see. And then he says that if you have to torture the boys, you should torture Hank and leave Dean out of it in front of Hank in disguise. Like, that isn't to say the primary story of 21 rallying the team to uncover Zero's identity and saving everyone isn't great. It's actually spectacular, and I will say this about the Venture Brothers, it doesn't try and pull a surprise out of nowhere. Zero doesn't have a voice modulator or anything in his mask. His armor isn't super misleading on purpose. He sounds exactly like who he is, and from the context clues, you could absolutely figure out who he is on your own. If the clues weren't there and they just threw it at you, yeah, it would be a little jarring, but still kind of makes sense. Here it's just kind of flawless. Zero is, in fact, Henchman 1, a.k.a. Scott Hall. He survived the fight with Brock and vowed his revenge, setting it in motion as he threw down with 21 who used to be protected by plot armor, but can now stand on his own two feet. In a way, that's just more growth for him, taking down Zero with better planning and strategy. And while Doc is being tortured, Hank ups the torture level until Doc tells him why he wants Hank tortured over Dean. And in probably the most human moment he's had, he confesses it's because he knows he can take it. That Dean was born for this life and Hank was just thrown into it. And he sees so much of himself in Hank and just wants to apologize for him. Of course, he has no idea that Hank can hear him, but it's moments like this and in later episodes that show us deep, deep down, Doc cares about both of his boys. He wants to do better with them than he was raised. He wouldn't do all this if he didn't care. He's a bad dad, sure, but he's at least trying to do better. And considering what comes afterwards, this is definitely needed. The Venture Brothers really banks on emotional leverage. How much can they get away with a character before they just feel irredeemable? It's the only show where someone like Sergeant Hatred can exist. Like, yeah, that's, that's a lot of character develop and it's a lot to talk about no matter what angle you approach it, but they take the time to build up all the facets of their character so that when they do something, they hope you still can see the character aside from the action. I, I don't know. Forewarning, I guess, because it's, it's going to get a little awkward. Any which way but Zeus is terrific. The Mike Lazo nod is great, and just again, it shows why the show is such a multifaceted gem. No matter what angle you approach it from, you're getting something great. Want just a dumb, super-powered form of bureaucracy with great jokes written in? You got it. An action thriller featuring a Greek god and an old rival? Hey, hey, you're all set. A conflict between father and son with a heart-to-heart -heart that feels genuinely earned? Sappy, but I'm here for it. All of this wrapped and showcased in 23 glorious minutes. They have so carefully fine-tuned everything to just sing. Welcome to our cross-sequel, our parallel parts, a, a congruent continuation. Hank and Dean have adventures at the same time. Boom. 
With Dean heading to the Big Apple to study as a junior scientist slash boy reporter at an internship at Impossible Plaza, Hank is left to find a job at the compound to figure out what he wants to do next. He then proceeds to open his own shop on the compound as a means to both pretend and make some money reselling his dad's stuff. He's still a kid, but it's great to see. Really dumb fun fact, but I don't know, I think it adds to the charm. So the Venture Brothers would do a Shirt of the Week Club where every episode came with a shirt, and I'll be honest, I typed a good portion of this season's script while wearing my Hank Co. t-shirt. I, I genuinely think that that camaraderie, that community, that devotion to the fans really does elevate the show. It shows that they really do care. Like, there's next to no American Dad merchandise at all. Venture Brothers had these delightful little almost like Mego dolls, you had bed sheets, a shirt of the week, and just that feeling that it harkened back to a simpler time, even if it was completely made up. Is this rambling? Probably, but who cares? It adds to it, and it really shows it wasn't just a cash grab. Anyway, Hank has many facilities at Hankco. You've got a restaurant, a department store, oh, and a grizzled private detective agency determined to get to the bottom of any case they've assigned. Like, Hank is a little bit of everything. He's a notary. Anyway, Hank takes the mystery of Dermot's mom going missing and Al, being bored and newly single, decides to join in on the fun. The episode goes black and white and he talks in a true neo-noir old-time detective style. It's a great homage to the Billy Wilder and Carol Reed movies of old. I gotta say, Dana Snyder's performance as Al really shines through this episode. With everything going on, I don't know, compared to all the other voices he does, Al feels like the one he put the most care into. Master Shake is just a lot of screeching in a good way, gazpacho is gazpacho. But Al, I don't know, for a man with such an iconic voice, he knows how to make his characters feel unique, and Al, I think, is one of his absolute best. Who's stalling? I'm not stalling, I just really appreciate voice acting. The greatest lies are the lies we tell ourselves. All right, let's just, uh, let's just get into it. Dermot's sister comes by the agency and flirts with Hank. She's a collector of old collectibles and tries to help to get to the bottom of the case. Hank is determined to find out if Dermot really is Brock's kid, even asking Brock himself, who outright refuses it. Look, we have been given a lot to enjoy about these characters. We have seen high highs and low lows. This is a meteoric descent, but it's a controlled dive. That's the best way I can describe this. It's the controlled dive to shake you awake and make you realize what kind of show you're watching. While Hank is losing his innocence with Dermot's older sister, Al and Orpheus decide to enchant a key to see what the full truth is. There, they discover that Doc had slept with the president of his fan club, a teenage Nikki, and got her pregnant, her mother saying she'd raise the child as her own. That child is Dermot. Dermot is Hank and Dean's half-brother. He is a venture. Yeah, it, it feels really gross, but it's also not even all that out of character for a character like Doc. It's just, yeesh, you, you don't feel good watching it. Honestly, the last bit with Hank gushing to a now memory white version of himself that he got laid feels like a flower blooming in a field of ash. Like he's still just Hank. The sins of the father don't trickle down. He's just trying to live his life, and man, Hank has gone from being like the most whatever character to one of the most endearing, wholesome entities ever. The best part is they don't forget how to write him. He just stays this perfect season after season. I'm sorry, I'm tearing up. My boy Hank can do no wrong. And in the Bose credits, when we get the return of Dean, a mysterious version of Doc appears from the future, maybe? And as we take that controlled dive down, we immediately pull up as we get a terrific joke-filled episode. Dean is an intern in New York, absolutely, but he's interning for the Revenge Society, operating in secret, and wacky hijinks ensue. His narration as a boy reporter is great, and you really get the sense of who Dean is. We've been given really strong Hank episodes, and even though we got perchance Dean earlier in the season, this is probably the one where we get the best idea of who he is now. We also get a drastically different Professor Impossible, and I think that really works for this new side of the character. Having him totally transform after stopping the explosion on Spider Skull Island just makes sense, and again, Bill Hader's masterful performance really brings him home. We get the demise of Manservant, the return of the 
Baron, and Baron, Phantom Limb, and the Professor decide to hold tryouts to join their illustrious new evil organization. All while Doc explores NYC and picks up going to shows on Broadway, where he gets inspired to bunk with Dean and pursue his dream of making a hit musical about his life as a boy adventurer. This is also our first appearance of Brown Widow, played by a little-known actor who I'm sure no one watching this has ever heard of before, Nathan Fillion. That's right, the man whose most notable role is Professor Mobius in the greatest video game ever made, Fallout New Vegas. Nope, I hasn't been in another thing ever. So good of them to give this rising star a chance. I've got jokes for days on these bacon trays. I, like, I think the greatest thing about this is that Dean wants to be a junior reporter. He has his own passions and he isn't afraid to start standing up for what he thinks is right. Hank is confident to the point of being headstrong. Dean is practical and careful and shines because of it. The Revenge Society also gets a ton of development, not only with the new members Fat Chance and Lyndon B, but the introduction of such classics as Scare Bear and Brick Frog. Look. At the time of writing this, there is a strike going on for fair pay for WGA and SAG members, and I am not being facetious at all when I say, no matter how much AI develops, it could never come up with the sheer creativity needed to make a character like Brick Frog. Hear me out. It's easy to make a Magneto or Doctor Doom type character. There's plenty of templates to just plug and play and boom, you have a classic big bad. Very easy, very simple. Traumatic backstory? Sure, traumatic backstory? Throw it out there, who cares? But no machine can truly understand the human condition enough to fathom the sheer and utter brilliance of a dude in a frog costume holding a brick. Why does Brick Frog work? Why did this character have just enough screen time to become an overnight icon and not be an overly annoying or overused character? I know it's gauche to explain a joke, but comedic timing is so vital to writing and something that only a human can understand. Even in this anti-meta meme era, the reason jokes work a lot of the time is that they don't have that traditional timing. But this interview scene works so well because it maintains a steady tempo. Remember, there were still laugh track sitcoms coming out in 2010, but they're not telling you to laugh at these parts. They know you're going to laugh, because a character like Brick Frog just smiling with a brick in his hand and a heart full of dreams hits right at your very core. And look, I just really, 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 really like Brick Frog. I made seven reviews about this show so that I could trap you in the middle of the fourth season and give you my speech on why Brick Frog works. You just got Brick Frogged. Tell all your friends. Where everybody comes to Hank's heads revelations about the past, Bright Lights Dean City very much develops the future. Seeing the Revenge Society take off, Doc get brought back from an alternate universe where he tried to take himself out and steal his hit show on Broadway, and having Dean come into his own really emboldens a sense of hope you feel at the end of Everybody Comes to Hank's. The boys are growing up. I think this is one of the few shows that handles that growth and maturing perfectly. You feel their growth and seeing Dean trying to run everything and take charge of his role really, I... I don't know, makes him feel dependable and confident in his own way. He may be awkward, but he's still a venture. Man, oh manity, I can't even say the title of this episode without getting demonetized. The family is playing touch football outside when Brock senses someone is getting in his new eco-friendly, Adrian, and it's Doc in a hypnotic trance with a note saying goodbye, cruel world. And after trying to set off a road flare in his mouth, the family investigates. Sure enough, it's the monarch doing an against the rules brain taking to try and take out Doc once and for all, while Gary and Sheila try and keep it under wraps since it's definitely not sanctioned. Orpheus decides to go inside Doc's mind to see what's troubling him. I feel like self-medication was enough of a positive light on Doc to make what happened and everybody comes to Hank's at least palatable. And then we have this episode that is a literal exploration of his mind, with Thanatos and Eros, played by Pete and Billy respectively, as Orpheus has to encounter his ego, id, and super id. It's a much more complex exploration of the layers of the mind than you get in a traditional Jinkies, we have to go into their mind and stop the evil demon and they just gotta face their fears to beat it, blah blah blah. This looks at the facets of his personality he keeps hidden. The trauma he's endured, the remorse he feels for his dead clone sons, and having the monarch just trying to do anything and everything to take him out from inside his brain is just amazing. Like he could be trying to find information or his deepest darkest secrets while inside his mind, but no, that's not what he's about. No, he wants Doc to suffer. That's his whole reason for doing this. If it was any other character, they'd feel monotone, but Monarch does it with such gusto, you genuinely see a personality formed around the destruction of Dr. Venture. 
Gary and Sheila, while keeping the monarch secret, begin to bond and start nerding out with one another, and I don't know, it plays off of what we saw in Butter Glider brilliantly. Even when they start to make out towards the end of the episode, it again feels earned. It feels like something to push the story forward in a natural way. You almost root for Gary as he comes into his own. He's no longer just a henchman, he's Gary. And even if we don't look at the complex exploration of Doc's broken mind or the simmering tension between Sheila and 21, there's still a smaller but still important ongoing arc of hatred feeling overshadowed by Brock. Here, he's come into the Venture family as a replacement for Brock and tried to help them grieve after he disappeared, but then BAM! Brock's back and his place in the family feels jeopardized. A man that's already lost his wife and just wants to help and keep his new family safe is feeling alone again. I don't know, it's why Hatred actually works as a character. He's trying to do good. He's trying to be good. He didn't have to have a conscience, he didn't have to try so hard to win the boy's approval, but he put in that time and it's only right that he feels like he's part of the family. This episode is very much the beginning of the end. It's the last episode before we jump into the end of the season where things will never be the same. I feel like this episode with the title is a much needed flatline moment. You're not going on a grand adventure, you're seeing what Rusty has had to endure and you almost feel a sense of pity for him just exists to remind you who these characters are as we turn the corner. Billy has been practicing medicine without a license, and when a doctor tries to get that rectified, he quickly bolts out only to discover that the investors that put conjectural technologies on the map were none other than the silent investors from earlier who he's convinced are vampires. They come in the night and abduct the poor quiz boy and take him to meet with the mighty monstroso while Pete goes to Sphinx for help. Like outside of an appearance of hatred, the rest of the Venture family are just absent from the episode and it largely lands on Billy, Brock, and Shoreleaf to carry the episode and it actually really works. Billy bonds with Monstroso, who promises him eternal glory if he helps him, and Brock and Shoreleaf team up with the pirate captain to go and hunt down Monstroso's boat. We also get King Gorilla having his heart taken for a transplant, we later discover it's for Monstroso, whose heart is failing him due to his sheer size. All of this arranged, of course, by the silent investors and their mysterious ways. Like, that's it. That's the whole episode. Billy is tired of being used for shadowy underground deals and wants to be a real doctor, and Monstroso gives him the opportunity to do that if he does one less operation under questionable circumstances. There is no double cross. There is no deal with the devil. It's just surprisingly above board. I don't know. It makes his speech about the Hippocratic Oath hit different. Here's a former boy genius dedicated to wanting to help people, and sure, he may not have that fancy degree, but he's still trying his hardest and he gets the job done. Billy and Pete have been jokes for a long time, but having Pete realize how important Billy is to him, and Billy actually fighting to take charge of his own destiny feels well earned. Even in the end of the episode, when he could have just handed Monstroso over to Brock and Shoreleaf, he doesn't. He fights to make sure his patient will heal even if he'll immediately get taken out. The Silent Partners does obviously kick things into motion for the season finale, but it does it in a natural way. This could be a one and done episode that just never gets brought up again, but this is Venture Brothers we're talking about here. Almost everything serves a bigger purpose, and this growth for Pete and Billy is vital for what comes next season. I don't think you're ready, viewer. A storm is coming. A storm of pennies. The Silent Partners is tense in a good way, and I love that it can walk that tightrope of comedic and suspenseful like only this show can. I mean, we're 15 episodes into the season, and even at my most critical, there wouldn't be a single episode under an 8 out of 10. Imagine fine crafting a season to such an insane degree that each episode feels wholly perfect for the tone, characters, and narrative you've developed. And then there's Operation Prom. It's not even an episode. It's a, it's a formative experience. I know this review is somewhat short in comparison to the others, but consider it your last inhale before we dive into the brilliance we're about to behold. And again, The Silent Partners has a lot to love. It humanizes Monstroso, who we've otherwise only seen as this double-crossing, backstabbing villain. He's actually human. He may seem monstrous, he may seem like Monstroso, but he still enjoys having fun, he still has that delight, he still wants to live. And I, I think that's one of the most important messages of the Venture Brothers is that deep down, you want to survive. Oh boy. And here we are. 
With the boys graduating, there's only one thing to do. Throw them the best homeschooled prom that 500 bucks can buy. Oh, and Hunter is going to confront Traster on the OSI Sky Base with a giant monstroso-sized bargaining chip alongside Sky Pilot. The intro isn't something dynamic. It's actually designed like a movie with proper opening credits, much like the showdown at Cremation Creek. That shows how they try to elevate this to a full-on media masterpiece. Like you have a sky-based showdown juxtaposed with a bunch of adult adventurers, magicians, super scientists, soldiers, throwing just a prom in a hangar. We also get a ton of focus on Gary this episode as he tries to bury 24's skull to get the voice out of his head, convinced he isn't real, even though the ghost of 24 does interact with other people. I don't know, the is he crazy or possessed idea really works for Gary, because not only is it easier to fool people with animation than it is live action, it just sort of fits that Gary would imagine a kind of forced ghost companion for himself, but he does want to get over that, he wants to get better. He doesn't want that anymore, and that is just next level. I mean, you have short leave and hatred competing on who's got the better shot picking off 21's body armor. That's all in the first four minutes of this episode. There's so much jam-packed in because they know and trust you can follow along. We then jump to the boys in a limo with Dean picking up Triana, who we get a reveal of her new boyfriend, Raven, a very obvious Twilight reference, and Hank is going stag after a failed attempt to pick up the male lady. Classic Hank. Instead, Dermot tags along because, of course he does. I gotta admit, Dean is the most uncomfortable part of this episode. His jealousy towards Triana and Raven just feels really odd, considering he quote-unquote moved on while meeting girls at the mall earlier in the season. I, I don't know, I, I feel like there was a different way to handle this, but in the long run, it does make sense for his character. It's great that Brock is just back, by the way. Like, he could have just stayed in Sphinx and avoided the boys, but it really shows he and all these people really care about them. Like, in their own twisted ways, they want this to go well for Hank and Dean. This is a celebration of them. And then we cut to the Pupa twins, Tim, Tom, and Kevin, checking off boxes on 21's vengeance list, showing they were the ones that moved the skull and tweaked his list, proving 21 was being messed with. It's so quick, it's so almost shrugged off, but if you pay attention to what's being revealed here, it not only makes Tim, Tom, and Kevin look even worse, it almost vindicates 21 being so tormented. It makes Gary that much more empathetic. Monarch finds out that 21 went to the Venture compound and he decides to take Sheila for a surprise assault just for Gary to wake up at Sphinx headquarters with Shoreleaf to help fight off some of Monstrosa's men with Rookie and the rest of the crew. We then cut to Hunter being accosted by Cardholder and Doe on his way to meet with Traster, and this is when things just ascend for me. I've talked about Toby Huss before, but like it can't be understated how much character, how much personality he puts into these characters, and how creatively he uses his voice. Much like Dana Snyder, once you hear it, his voice is very iconic and distinct, and yet the cadence makes his characters feel unique. Traster is a role he was born to play. Like that is a character that if done by anyone else would not be the same. A Roger without Seth MacFarlane, a Homer without Dan Castelletta. Toby Huss is Traster because the absolute absurdity that leaves his mouth only works because of the delivery. I mean, you have Hunter literally grappling with the head of the OSI and the winner gets Monstroso. He reveals there's two guild spies in the OSI and Traster starts freaking out over the insinuation before Cardholder and Doe take Hunter out and get Traster taken care of. I, man, this episode is just something truly and genuinely special. Like, after they fight Monstroso's men and Brock comes back with the boys, the boys invite Gary to the prom and call him a hero. They value him, and you can just see that smile on his face, and it actually feels great. Look at how far he's come. People actually like him. They value him. He feels like he's had an actual journey of growth that you've seen in real time. He's becoming multifaceted, all while the Monarch and Sheila raid the Venture compound with a prisoner in the trunk. Cutting back, we see Traster is trapped in some kind of amber after hulking out. He's a Hulk. Cardholder and Doe were very much the Guild agents, something you could absolutely believe, but the twist still feels expertly crafted. Anyway, Doc hires some ladies of the night, and prom is on! Hatred catches the Monarch, and they basically say they didn't come to fight and even bring Princess Tinyfeet as a bargaining chip. 
Full disclosure, the reason I said there were uncensored versions of the show out there in Season 3 was mostly because of this episode. The gang all start arguing over what the bedroom technique of Rusty Venture entails, whether it's a gay or straight move, and going in full-on gruesome detail, a la the aristocrats. The censored bleeps are great, but I don't know, there's also just a charm to the uncensored insanity. Doc concocts a special Spanish fly formula to stop striking out with the ladies, and Shallow Gravy performs their chart-topping hit, Jacket. There's actually a little short after Operation Prom that was just a DVD extra, and you can tell since it goes from being this crisp HD animation to just effectively flash with extra steps. The great part about it is it's a behind-the-music parody narrated by Bill Hader, of all people. Like, to get him as some characters is great, sure, but here he is on this little 11-minute video just having some fun with it. I don't know. I think it's terrific. Don't skip over it, as it is the first time Doc starts to piece together who Dermot really is and does have an impact going forward. Jacket is also just really catchy, and the music video they make for it is terrific and helps get the taste of Dean's awkward blow-up at Triana out of your mouth. He hears her describing a rusty venture, gets jealous, yells at her about diapers, and she justifiably runs off. It's not a flattering light for Dean, which admittedly helps make what happens next season work so much better. I just want to say... Trunk Triad is fantastic. Orpheus and Jefferson just gelling and being bros is so wholesome. Like, I don't know, having these moments where they're just drunk, letting their guard down, and having a good time makes you really believe they're old friends. And Orpheus talks with Gary, who tries to get him to see 24, and the mysterious mystical man can't. He even points out that Baba OJ is there, and Orpheus and Jefferson tell him Baba OJ is not even dead yet. The figments of Gary's imagination were wrong. For the first time, Gary can accept that his friend is gone. You can argue a lot about the red herrings in the Ghost of 24 storyline, but this scene, this closure isn't treated as a joke. There's a sense of relief around it, but it's not played up, it's not exaggerated. Just for the first time in a long time, Gary has some peace and hugs it out with a very supportive Orpheus and Jefferson. Again, these wholesome moments in an adult swim show of all places just feels right in a way. It's just kind of perfect. Brock takes one of the ladies back to the factory when Rookie reveals they are in fact Molotov, determined to break Monstroso out and take him where he belongs after knocking Brock out. Hunter and Mile High are captured and thrown in a cell as Cardholder and Doe go to take out Monstroso, and Hunter is invited to the secret bridge, all while Hank, Dean, and Dermot go to impress Triana. But the growth of Gary isn't over yet. He confides in Monarch that he likes the ventures and actually decides to quit. He's in love with Sheila and talks about making out on top of Monarch, who just shrugs it off, which really speaks to the strength of their relationship. Brock wakes up and sees Molotov driving away and is determined to not let her or Monstroso go. Hunter finds out that Tracer is piloting the OSI from the secret bridge, and Tracer tells him he knows he's not a Hulk and that Cardholder and Doe are double agents. This is why he's so great. He reveals he had double agents in Sphinx, including Mile High slash Sky Pilot, and that he's retiring due to his cancer and leaves the OSI in the hands of Hunter in hopes that alien technology can cure him. Hank and Dean are crowned the king and king, but aren't there, so it goes to hatred and tiny feet as Pulps, like a friend, starts to play in the background. Meanwhile, Maltov and Brock have one last heart-to-heart -heart while she reveals that she's with Monstroso and actually loves him. She then tells him that her black hearts have infiltrated the prom and will take out the whole family if Brock doesn't let her go. Seeing Brock rush home while Like a Friend plays in the background is probably one of the best endings to anything in the history of ever. This is four seasons of payoff. This is four seasons of a journey coming to an end. It's just raw and probably the best song choice ever used in any show. It's not just a pop song that's popular at the time or something that will evoke emotion. They had every intention of this song playing at this point. It feels the tone, the story, the evolution of these characters. And as the Blackhearts turn into bug monsters and Brock is ready for war, the series cuts. We get an after credit scene of Dean effectively burning a cross on Triana's lawn, and that goes about as well as you'd expect. And that's how season four ends. I know there was always that talk that they didn't know if Operation Prom would be the conclusion of the series or not, and I gotta say, with everything that comes afterwards, it's smart that they wrapped all the major plot points, but still left enough unanswered that they could keep going if they wanted to. 
Operation Prom is truly something special and a brilliant testament to the raw emotional power animation can provide. Don't try in front. I have never met someone that likes the Venture Brothers that doesn't also just love Operation Prom. It's one of the best crafted episodes of the entire series and of media in general. You grow as a person from watching it. I genuinely and truly believe it has the power to evolve you emotionally. There's just a raw depth of vulnerability to prom that makes it feel earned and deserved. They took the time with these characters and now here we are reaping the rewards of seeing them shine in their own rights, of coming into an actualization of who they truly are. Operation Prom is how you wrap something if you don't know if you'll be coming back. It gives everyone a satisfying conclusion, it gives everything a way to walk away into that sunset. It's how season 4 could conclude in a satisfying way. Good gravy, that was a lot to cover, but we got through it. I know this is longer than even some of my American Dad reviews, but it's just so necessary to go this in-depth with the series because of how special it is. Season 4 may very well be the best crafted season of the entire show and carries an extraordinary amount of narrative weight on its shoulders. This is the tipping point of the series and the kicking off point for a new normal. This cements the Venture Brothers as one of the greatest animated shows of all time, and everything afterwards just keeps pushing it up that ladder, including my favorite episode in the next season, which I'm sure many of you can guess which one it is. Season 4 isn't a reset of the world, but it is a new normal. Hank and Dean aren't just waking up in their same beds and living their same lives as we turn into Season 5. The characters all have tangible growth, both good and bad, and we get to see it on display. I don't know, obviously I'm gushing, but with everything great that we saw in Season 4, that doesn't mean any of the seasons afterwards are any weaker at all. If anything, with all the revelations and growth, we're getting an even more mature series that I'm so excited to talk about with you all. We're over halfway through the series, tragically, but this back half is just packed full of quality. And so, what was your favorite episode of Season 4? Least favorite? Anything you think I was right on? Wrong on? Let me know in the comments below. And if you liked what you saw, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And of course, tell your friends we're out here. We've also got a Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and Twitch, where I should be gearing up for a game show on here soon. As always, thank you all so much for watching this little passion project of mine. And I hope you stay strong, keep fighting, know I believe in you, and that everything will always get better. I'll see you all next time as we take a dive into Season 5. Go Team Venture! Goodbye, everybody.